Hi, I'm Kelly, and today we're going to talk about three science-backed ways to improve egg quality and the research behind those. The first way to improve egg quality is with CoQ10. CoQ10 has peer-reviewed research backing it, and it's probably the most well-researched of all the options we're going to talk about today. In one double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial that included IVF patients aged 35 to 43, the rate of aneuploidy was 46% in the CoQ10 group compared to 62% in the control. And aneuploidy is something you don't want. That means an egg that doesn't have the right amount of chromosomes or the their chromosomes basically don't look perfect. And the clinical pregnancy rate was 33% for the CoQ10 group and 26.7% for the control group. So the patients that took CoQ10, not only did their egg quality look better, but also their pregnancy success rate was higher. There was another study that evaluated the association between follicular levels and CoQ10 levels and also pregnancy rate. It found that follicular fluid CoQ10 levels were significantly higher in grades A and B than grades C and D embryos. And A and B embryos are the embryos that you want, they look like they're more healthy versus the lower C and D, they look less. The concentration of the follicular fluid CoQ10 levels were also significantly higher in the pregnancy group. So this study found, in conclusion, we find a positive correlation between follicular fluid CoQ10 concentrations and subsequent embryo quality and pregnancy rates. Our results might be supportive of the usage of CoQ10 as a supplement in women undergoing in vitro fertilization. Then there was another study that looked at the antioxidant effects of CoQ10 on low ovarian reserve patients. The intervention in this study group included oral administration of CoQ10, and in this one they used the GNC brand, which is available anywhere in the U.S., and they used 200 milligrams three times a day for a period of 60 days. What they found is that CoQ10 pretreatment resulted in significantly lower medicine that they needed to give the IVF patients and also higher peak E2 levels. Women in the CoQ10 group had increased numbers of received oocytes and higher fertilization rate and also more high quality embryos. And significantly less women treated with CoQ10 had canceled embryo transfers because of poor embryo development than in the control group. And more women from the treatment group had available cryopreserved embryos, which means that they were just able to freeze more embryos for those patients. The clinical pregnancy rate and live birth rates per embryo transfer and per one complete stimulation cycle tended to be higher in the CoQ10 group, but did not achieve statistical significance. So they're saying that the pregnancy rate might not have been higher, but other things like the egg quality and the embryo quality and the number of embryos that were available, all of that was better. Now, if you would like to take CoQ10, they recommend taking 600 milligrams, which is best taken 200 milligrams at a time, maybe like three times throughout the day. And it's best to take the ubiquinol form of CoQ10. So if you look on, on the bottle, it'll not only say CoQ10, but in the ingredients, it will say ubiquinol. Now you will find if you're looking for CoQ10, if you buy just the plain CoQ10 that is not ubiquinol, plain CoQ10 will be cheaper. But the reason why you don't necessarily want to go the cheaper route is because while it is cheaper, your body is not able to absorb as much of it. So it's like you're taking 200 milligrams, but maybe your body is only absorbing 100 of those milligrams. So it'll be better if you spend a little bit more and get the one that's ubiquinol because your body will receive all 200 milligrams that you're actually taking. Ubiquinol is easily available on Amazon. And my favorite way to take it was actually, if you go to Costco, it's available in liquid form and you take like a little shot glass of, of the CoQ10. And I appreciated the liquid form because there were so many pills that I was taking at that point that one less pill was so much better. The next way to improve egg quality is DHEA. Now this one has some research backing it in certain circumstances, but DHEA is not a blanket treatment for everyone. Um, please do not go out and just buy DHEA because it is on this list. It is only gonna be helpful in specific circumstances. And there are actually circumstances in which it will be harmful if you take DHEA. 
So please listen closely and see if you fall into one of these categories. This study studied DHEA in IVF patients with diminished ovarian reserve. And what they found is that our findings indicate that the use of DHEA associated with a better pregnancy rate, a lower frequency of abortion, which means miscarriage, it doesn't actually mean abortion in this case, but without affecting average oocyte retrieval. But you should check your testosterone level and also your DHEAS level before you start taking DHEAS. Because if your testosterone level is high, and for example, um, many women with PCOS will have an elevated level of testosterone. So if your testosterone is already high and then you start taking DHEA, then it'll boost your testosterone even more. And that could do more harm than good. And it could basically slow down your ovulation. It could m damage your eggs instead of helping your eggs. So you definitely don't want to do this one without doing a blood test first. Now, I recommend that you ask your doctor if he or she will check your testosterone level and your DHEAS level. If your doctor doesn't want to do this, then you're, you can still check it on your own, at least here in the U.S. you can. Um, I'll put a link down in the description below. Um, there are websites where you can actually order your own labs. You don't have to have a doctor. Um, I use ultalabs.com. Um, it's pretty cheap. It's not that expensive to check your own level. And if you find that yours are low, then you might want to try the DHE. Now, if you find that your testosterone is low, the recommended dose is 25 milligrams three times a day. So it ends up being 75 milligrams. Um, but you want to spread it out throughout the day, like one in the morning, one at lunch, and one at night. And most importantly, this is not a drug that you want to be on long term. You do not want to take DHEA for like a year or longer. You want to take it for a short period of time and then recheck your testosterone. So it's recommended that you take it for six weeks and then check your testosterone at the end of the six weeks. Um, if your testosterone has improved, then you stop taking it at that point and you kind of wait and see what happens. See if that improved your egg quality and you might get pregnant. If you retake the test after six weeks and you find that your testosterone didn't change at all, then you probably need to talk to your doctor because you might need actual testosterone, like, and that's usually in the form of an injection. So you might need like the real stuff instead of just the DHEA. The difference is that DHEA is a precursor to testosterone and also to other hormones. So like in the in the sort of chart of how your hormones are made, DHEA is made first and then testosterone is made from DHEA. So if you have more DHEA, in theory, you should get more testosterone, but maybe you have something going on in your body where that conversion isn't happening and you might need just testosterone straight. And testosterone is not available unless you have a prescription and I believe it's only available in an injection but I could, no, you can also do a gel, I know that. But the point is you need to talk to your doctor to get it. The third option for improving your egg quality is melatonin. Now this one has early research. Um, it's definitely not as well researched as let's say CoQ10, for example, but the early research is promising. So you might wanna try it if you've tried other things and nothing has helped so far. And basically the way that they think that melatonin might be helpful is that melatonin is an antioxidant. So what exactly does that mean? Well, oxidation is basically like, you can imagine it as being rust. So oxidation happens to metal in the outside world. Uh, whenever things are exposed to the environment, eventually they will oxidize and that will make them rust. So now imagine that happening inside your body. I mean, it's not actually rust, but we can use it as a metaphor. Just imagine that because your body, the insides and your cells and everything have been exposed to life, that eventually they get this sort of rust. And as we age, we have more oxidation and it's just a natural part of life. But there are also things that we do that might accelerate that and might result in more oxidation. Things like unhealthy diets, like if we eat unhealthy food. Things like smoking is very oxidative. Um, certain disease states will be oxidative. But there are also things that we can do that are antioxidative. We can take things that are an antioxidant. We can eat food that's very healthy and antioxidant. So melatonin is 
an antioxidant. So what they think is happening, and they're not exactly sure. Basically, there is around the egg, when the egg is forming, it's called a follicle, and so there's follicular fluid around the egg. And so the thought is that if you have a lot of oxidative stress in your body, then there's a lot of this oxidative stuff surrounding the egg and the fluid of the egg. And you can imagine that if you were like a little tiny microscopic baby egg trying to form, that a bunch of these negative oxidative rust things around you probably wouldn't be good and it wouldn't be beneficial. So anything that we can do that would be antioxidant and particularly antioxidant to the follicular fluid around the egg, then that's beneficial and that's going to result in a higher quality egg. So this study says, while the beneficial nature of melatonin, an endogenous antioxidant, has been known for decades, the investigation into the role of melatonin in the treatment of infertility is still in its infancy. Um, it says that infertility treatments in general are associated with significant levels of reactive oxygen species, which basically means that whenever you're taking all of that medicine that you have to take for IVF in order to increase your hormones, think about it like normally you have one egg over one month, but when you're going through IVF, you might get like 10 eggs, let's say. So basically you had to put your body through 10 months worth of hormone in order to get those 10 eggs. And so your body has essentially had 10 months worth of oxidation within a one month time. I mean, this is, I'm definitely generalizing here, but the point is that you have more oxidation because you're having to take artificial hormones. So this study says that we know this oxidative stuff that you have to take for IVF has the potential to negatively affect the quality of oocytes or eggs and embryos. And it says melatonin shows promise as an adjunctive therapy in the treatment of infertility. Its unique antioxidant characteristics and safety profile make it an ideal adjunct therapy to be further investigated in well-designed, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials. So what this saying is that we already know that melatonin is very safe to take. That, you know, you're not gonna have any negative side effects from taking melatonin. And we already know that it has pretty good antioxidant characteristics. Now we don't know for sure that it's gonna specifically help the oxidative effect of the follicular fluid. We don't know that for certainty, but we have a pretty good hypothesis that it will. Now there's another study that tested the concentration of melatonin in the intrafollicular fluid. And what they found was that in patients with unexplained infertility, they had less melatonin found in that follicular fluid than patients that were more successful and didn't have infertility. So this suggests that supplementing with melatonin might sort of rebalance this antioxidant state within the follicular fluid. This study says, importantly, melatonin supplementation rebalanced the intrafollicular oxidative status, improved oocyte quality, and slightly enhanced IVF success rates in unexplained infertility patients. So, so far all the tests that have been done have been looking at infertility patients that are going through IVF. So it might be different um, if you're not going through IVF. We don't necessarily know if melatonin helps, but it probably doesn't hurt either. So if you've already tried CoQ10 and maybe you've already tried DHEA or maybe DHEA isn't for you and you're looking for another option, then melatonin might be an option to try just because it's so safe and it's so easy. If you do wanna try it, they recommend taking three milligrams per night. Now, the final way to improve egg quality that I'll just kind of throw in there as a bonus is royal jelly. Now this one, there are zero studies that have been done on human subjects. So this one is very much in its infancy. It's like maybe even before its infancy. Um, we don't have a lot of data on it, but we do have some data on animal studies and it shows promise in animal studies. So there's a possibility that it might work, but we definitely don't know a lot about royal jelly yet. In one study, they took immature female rats 
and they gave them either 100, 200, or 400 milligrams per kilogram of body weight of royal jelly daily for 14 days. And then they tested what their uterine and ovarian serum levels were of progesterone and estradiol. And they found that the rats that were given the royal jelly had a significantly increased level of progesterone and estradiol. And also in addition, a significant increase in the number of mature follicles and corpa luteate. So it is hypothesized that this royal jelly will help your hormones and thereby help your follicles and have better ovulation maybe, but we, we don't really know for sure now. So this one is definitely like the lowest one on the totem pole. I probably would not recommend this one unless you have just tried everything and you were just desperate to try things that don't have any evidence to support them yet. But hopefully we will continue to do research and maybe one day we'll have some answers to tell us if royal jelly works or not. So now that I've told you a couple of different ways to possibly improve egg quality, it's very important that you understand that throwing everything at yourself at once, like just taking all these medicines at once, probably isn't a good idea. Uh, first, if you do that, then if there's a side effect, then you won't know which medicine is giving you the side effect. For example, a lot of people say that DHEA will give them side effects. So you wanna take each one of these or start them separately. That way, if you have any side effects, you know which one you might need to discontinue. And the other reason why is because if one of them works or doesn't work, you don't really know which one it is. And one of them could kind of like counterbalance or cancel out the other one. We don't really know. There have certainly been no studies of taking these medicines together. So we don't know what they'll do if you take them all at once. So I would highly recommend that you start at the top with the CoQ10 that has been thoroughly researched. Start there. Um, start taking that and if that doesn't help after a couple of months then maybe move on and even after all of that it's still going to be hard for you to know if any of them work like which one worked so I will have links to all of this research down below if you are interested in reading or finding out more there's tons of information out there and I highly suggest that you research a little bit at least before you take any one of these medicines. So that's it for today. I hope this was helpful to someone. If you have any other recommendations or any things that you would like me to research to see if it is possible for egg quality, please leave it down in the comments below. I love researching things and so if there, you have any suggestions, I would love to hear them. And until next time, I wish you hope on your journey wherever it may take you.